I will always keep my videos here free. The only thing that I ask from you is to like and subscribe to my page. In this video, we'll be discussing viscerosomatic reflexes and the autonomic system with regards to osteopathic manipulation. This is probably the highest yield of the osteopathic portion of the DO exam. And lots of questions will come essentially from knowing which regions in the spinal cord relate to which organs in the body. And so I'll show you an easy way to get all of those questions right. But first, let's take a step back and look at some fundamentals of a spinal reflex. So here you're looking at a spinal cord and some nerves that are coming out of it. So you'll see some nerves on this side, some nerves on this side and also vertebral body. We have highlighted here the posterior nerve root of the first thoracic nerve. Remember, any of the nerves in the spine are essentially made up of a posterior and an anterior root. In this case, we're looking at the posterior root of one of the thoracic nerves. These will take the afferent somatic visceral sensory receptors. So that means they're getting information that's coming from the rest of the body towards the spinal cord. In this example, you can see an anterior nerve root of the first thoracic nerve. In these cases, these will have efferent information, which means information going away from the spinal cord and towards the rest of the body. Remember, efferent is always exiting, and that's away from the spinal cord. And the other one is the opposite. Afferent is going towards the spinal cord. In a basic reflex or a basic flow of information, it typically will go from the body to the posterior side. It will go then inside and interact with a bunch of interneurons. We won't go into the specifics. And then it can go back outside through the efferent route. This is an oversimplification, but it's enough for the purposes of this video. One important concept to understand viscerosomatic reflexes from the osteopathic perspective is facilitation. What we're referring to is in this reflex or in this pathway, sometimes things can be overstimulated. Those stimulus can be from viscera, which are organs. For example, if there is a stomach issue that's an organ, it can send visceral sensory input back to the spinal cord through the afferent route. Or the stimulus can come from somatic source. Somatic usually refers to other parts of the body, such as muscle spindles, Golgi tendons, and nociceptors. Or it can be coming from influence from the brain. And when that's the case, this portion gets very sensitive to any kind of stimulation that goes to this particular segment. And when that happens, it can reflex and it can affect all sorts of structures that are associated with this particular segment. These efferent routes can go anywhere in the body. This could mean a variety of different effects, including increased muscle tone, tissue changes, asymmetry, restriction, or tenderness in certain areas. The spinal cord isn't very good at knowing what comes from where all the time. So sometimes it responds locally, and we can actually see asymmetry or tissue changes at this particular segment in the spinal cord when we're palpating the thoracic or the spinal region. When we find one of those findings nearby to the segment, so let's say we're talking about the stomach, which will be innervated from the mid-thoracic region, we may find some tissue texture changes in the mid-thoracic region because those are referred changes from one of the viscera. So that's called tissue texture changes. For example, if we have a gallbladder issue, that's referring to a particular segment of the thoracic region, you may have some paraspinal tenderness in this area in the back. You may feel some kind of somatic dysfunction. The primary types of reflexes to know are viscerosomatic and somatovisceral. Really, the biggest one to know is viscerosomatic. That is the biggest one that they will be testing you on. When a visceral stimulus produces a somatic response, for example, a gallbladder issue will transmit sensory input from the gallbladder, which has visceral receptors, to the spinal cord, causing T5 through a T9 segment to be facilitated or in constant stimulus, getting very sensitive and have an exaggerated response. That could impact local muscle structures and cause tension or asymmetry or tissue changes close to the spinal cord. There's also another kind of reflex called somatovisceral 
natural reflex. You don't get too much questions on this, except if they give you something that, that is obviously starting with a somatic input, then it's going to be somatovisceral. For example, the pectoralis muscle causing a reflex to the heart causing a heart problem. So that comes from the muscle, which is somatic, to an organ, which is visceral. That's an example of somatovisceral, but I wouldn't spend too much time on that. What you need to know for exam purposes is which organs or which parts of the body is associated with which particular segments in the spinal cord. Before we go over that chart, let's take one step back and talk quickly about the autonomic system. The reflexes that we're talking about all go through the autonomic system. The autonomic system includes parasympathetic and sympathetic influence. These systems can do a variety of things outside of the scope of this video, but I will give you some key points that I think are some important pearls. These nerve structures come from either the cranial or the sacral portions for the parasympathetic system or thoracic region mostly for the sympathetic system. All organs have both sympathetic and parasympathetic influence. A very rough but not very accurate but helpful way to think about these systems is fight or flight and rest and digest. The fight or flight system for the sympathetic part of autonomics could be thought of with a question, what would I want my body to do in a danger situation? For example, if I was scared of dogs and I saw a dog, my sympathetic system would kick in. I'd want to dilate my pupils to get more light so that I can have better vision. I want to inhibit things like salivation or digestion or intestinal muscle use. Why would I use those things? My body wants to put all the energy towards being safe from this dog. Relax my lung bronchial muscles to open the airways and allow more air in to be able to be used. I want to help my body get more adrenaline, more sugar, more glucose for immediate energy production. This sympathetic system stimulating will increase my heart rate to get more blood flow to the body so that I can use my muscles. In contrast, rest and digest can be thought of in the same way for the parasympathetic system. When we're resting, digesting, relaxed, happy, we're eating, we're digesting food, we're producing saliva, the heart rate is lower because we're relaxed, pupils are constricted because we don't necessarily need all of the light to come in. You can have an erection, for example. Although one thing to remember for the GU system is erection is stimulated by parasympathetics, but ejaculation is stimulated by sympathetics point and shoot parasympathetics for erection and sympathetics for ejaculation most questions you get will be about the sympathetic system but there are some general caveats and pearls that you should know before we go into a very high yield chart that is going to be very important to know with regards to the parasympathetic system all of this is either the vagus nerve or pelvic splanchnic nerves the vagus nerves comes from the cranial portion and the pelvic splanchnic from the sacral portion. All viscera that is proximal to the middle transverse colon with regards to the GI system is going to be vagus nerve. So if you have any questions which nerve for parasympathetics affects the ascending colon, for example, that's proximal to the transverse colon, so that's going to be the vagus nerve. Anything after that for parasympathetics like rectum, sigmoid, that's going to be pelvic splanchnic nerves. And that comes from the sacral portion. With regards to the GU system for parasympathetics, the proximal half of the GU system is going to be vagus nerve. So the kidneys, the upper part of the ureter, the rest of it is pelvic splanchnic nerve. So if you get a question, what innervates the parasympathetics for the lower ureter, that's not going to be vagus, that's going to be pelvic splanchnic. The ovaries and testes, you know, if you remember from embryology, they descended from a higher portion. And so they're actually going to be from the vagus nerve. So if you just remember the development of that, that should be easy to remember. So here in this chart, we're going to be focusing on T1 through L2, which are going to be your most common questions. Not very high yield, but if you get any questions about which region is affected by the upper extremities, your answer is going to be somewhere in between T2 and T8. If you get any questions about the lower extremities, that's going to be somewhere between T11 and L2. I like this format of showing you this. A lot of people use something like the House of Golden, if you're familiar with this, or other kinds of memory techniques. But I think it's a little easier looking at it from a chart. If you get any questions about the head and neck with regards to what segment would you see a viscerosomatic reflex, usually the answer will be somewhere between T1 and T4. And that kind of makes sense. The head and neck is the top of the body. It's at the beginning of the chart. Next, if you get any questions about the heart and they're asking you which viscerosomatic reflex, which region, then you would pick somewhere between T1, T5. So these questions are going to give you like several different 
answer choices that are different regions and you're going to have to pick the right one. So it should be easy to remember the head and neck and the heart at the beginning of the sympathetic chain, T1 to T4, T1 to T5. The answer is not going to be like T9 or T12 or L2. It's going to be coming from the sympathetic portion from T1 through T5. Similarly, the respiratory tract is going to be somewhere in the higher portion of the thoracic region for parasympathetics, T2 through T7, esophagus, T2 through T8. Some of these overlap. It'll be obvious on the questions which one is which. Now, the next part is the GI system, which I think is one of the highest yield portions of the questions. You have different divisions of the GI system. You have the upper GI which is the stomach, the liver, the gallbladder, the spleen, the pancreas, and the duodenum. Everything before the ligament of trites. That is a portion of the GI system that separates the upper GI from the rest of the GI system. And so the upper GI, if you just think about it, if you know the anatomy, think about the stomach and everything around the stomach, the liver, the gallbladder, the spleen is kind of close to all, it all comes back from the same vasculature, the same ganglion, the pancreas is right there, part of the duodenum, all upper GI, all of these will be T5 through T9. And all of these will be associated with the celiac ganglion. So that's a ganglion that can be treated osteopathic manipulation. You can do a ganglion release and you can facilitate or you can bring balance to some of the sympathetics that are coming through that portion. If you get a question about a liver issue or fatty liver or pancreatitis or a gallbladder or cholecystitis, an ulcer or gastritis, and they ask you which viscerosomatic reflex or what portion of the body, what portion of the spine is going to be the viscerosomatic reflex, you know that it's going to have to be between T5 and T9. The next major landmark is the splenic flexure. Anything before the splenic flexure and after the ligament of trites is called the middle GI system. So anything after ligament of trites before the splenic flexure, like jejunum, ileum, ascending colon, is going to be T10 and T11. That part of the GI system is associated with the superior mesenteric ganglion. Everything after the splenic flexure is the lower GI. The distal colon, the descending colon, the distal transverse colon, the descending colon, the sigmoid, the rectum. All of those will be after splenic flexure, therefore T12, L1, L2. That's all associated with the inferior mesenteric ganglion. The rest of these are a little bit more difficult to remember, but if you kind of know the general areas, then you'll be able to remember in general where they're from. For example, the kidneys, the gonads, the proximal ureters, the adrenal gland, all of those are going to be between T10 and T12, whereas the distal ureters and the appendix are going to be after T12, similar to the lower GI. You can remember the gonads because embryologically they initially started more proximal than where they ended up. The prostate and the uterus and the cervix and the penis and the clitoris and the bladder, all of those are going to be more the last numbers, T10, T11, L1, L2. Here's a view of the full chart. If you know this chart, you should get a lot of questions correct. You can also generally target the autonomic system and treat it in many different disease states. It is thought that lots of disease states may produce changes in the autonomic system, for example, making a lot of things hypersympathetic. And so some targets for osteopathic manipulation are rib raising, craniosacral manipulation, Chapman point targeting, ganglion release, paraspinal inhibition. All of these are areas that target the autonomic system. For example, rib raising can be used to normalize sympathetic activity. For patients, for example, with an ileus post-surgery who have overly sympathetic activity, then you can use this and improve the amount of time that the patient has an ileus. There's actually a lot of studies on that. Soft tissue paraspinal techniques can also normalize a sympathetic activity and can be used for a wide variety of reasons. To target the parasympathetic system in general, you can also use cranial manipulation condylar decompression or even sacral techniques. Patient has a history of cardiac failure. Which visceral somatic reflex would you see? Heart is going to be over here and so this is going to be a. Hey, next question. The parasympathetic system will do all the following except what? Well it will not dilate the pupils because that's the sympathetic system. All the rest of those answers are mediated by the parasympathetic system. A 65-year-old male has a COPD exacerbation. Where would you expect visceral somatic reflex? Again, that's going to be somewhere 
between T2 and T7. A 42-year-old female with a positive Murphy sign and right upper quadrant pain, which vertebral level would you expect to find somatic dysfunction? So in this question, you just have to know the chart and you have to know where the liver, you have to know it's talking about the liver, and the liver is going to be in the upper GI, and the upper GI, if you know the chart, is somewhere between T5 and T9. So this is going to be T5 to T9. A lot of questions are just going to be like this. You identify the organ, and then you just know the chart. Patient has a kidney stone obstruction at the distal ureter. Which of the following could be involved in any viscerosomatic reflexes? So they're asking, it can be either parasympathetic or the sympathetic system here. So can the vagus nerve be involved here? Well, the vagus nerve, if you remember for the GU parasympathetic, does innervate the proximal part of the GU system, and then the distal part is innervated by the pelvic splanchnic nerves of the parasympathetics. So both A and B could be involved depending on where the kidney stone is. So this is saying it's in the distal ureter, so it's affecting both the upper and the distal ureter. And that could be both the vagus and the pelvic splanchnic nerve. T12 to L1 are the sympathetic viscerosomatic reflexes. And T12 to L1 could be involved as well because that does have sympathetic innervation to the GU system. For D, T8 through T9, there's nothing in T8 through T9 that goes to the kidneys. Remember, that's going to be the middle GI system. Which of the following is not a sympathetic function? Remember, sympathetic is fight or flight, and in those scenarios, why would we ever need digestion? We're not going to be digesting something when we're running away from the dog. Which of the following supplies parasympathetic innervation to the appendix? The answer here is going to be vagus nerve. Some of you might ask, well, why isn't it T9 through T12? Well, in the question, they're asking you about parasympathetic innervation. Anything in the thoracic region does not do parasympathetics. So that is all sympathetics, so it cannot be anything in the thoracic region. So if you get a question that's asking about parasympathetics and they're giving you anything other than cranial sacral locations or vagus nerve, pelvic splanchnic nerve, then those answers are wrong. You can automatically cross those out. So a 60 year old male has trouble urinating at nighttime, wakes up several times, not feeling like he's completely emptying his bladder. Which portion of the spine can we target to help with his symptoms? So in this case, everything listed is referring to sympathetic regions. So it's going to be, we don't have to worry about differentiating sympathetic or not sympathetic because all the answers are are referring to sympathetic regions. They're talking about BPH, benign prostate hypertrophy. Basically, the question is, which region is associated with the prostate? And the answer here is, if you know the chart, T12 through L2.